Welcome to the secret garden of survival, how to grow a camouflage food forest. I'm the survivalist gardener, Rick Austin, and we are going to briefly go through uh, my presentation on how to grow your own secret garden of survival. Let's say you survive the end of the world as we know it, and let's say that you survive for one year. What are you and your livestock going to eat when those food stores run out? How will you replenish a year's food storage and then feed yourself each and every year after that? And almost more importantly, how do you keep others from stealing it? Do you think this is a garden? Who thinks this is a garden? Well, they are both gardens. Which one will the starving hordes eat? Which one produces more food? Well, the one on the right produces more food. It is a perennial food forest. Imagine a garden that you plant once in your lifetime, takes very little space, grows five times more food per square foot than a traditional garden, that provides food for the next 30 years, that you never have to weed, never have to use fertilizers, and never have to use pesticide, ever all disguised to look like overgrown underbrush. What it is, it's really what I like to call nature culture, which is natural agriculture, where you plant once and then harvest for a lifetime. You let nature do what nature does best, because in my opinion, man screws it up when he thinks he can do it better. <clears throat> you plant things together that create a symbiotic relationship. If anybody's read the book Carrots Love Tomatoes, it's like that, uh, but it's actually for an entire perennial ecosystem. You use plants to attract good bugs that'll kill the bad bugs. For example, if you plant onions around the base of a tree, mice won't go near it in the wintertime and gird that tree. If you plant daffodils around the drip line of a tree, deer won't go near it and steal your apples or pears or whatever. You do symbiotic pl plantings. Uh, for example, if you plant tomatoes next to catnip, now tomatoes on the left, catnip's in the middle. Uh, if you plant tomatoes next to catnip, uh, tomato hornworms won't go near it and won't bother your tomato plants. On the right hand side, you've got a uh, mustard plant, and that plant is actually bolting right now. So you can use mustard to uh, make mustard uh, from seed and actually make the condiment mustard. You can use the leaves and eat them, they're edible. You can use those in salads or on sandwiches. And uh, it's also a trap plant, and it will trap or catch um, many of the bad bugs that you don't want to have in the garden because they will go there first. So you have the opportunity to dispose of those bad bugs before they can do any harm to your other plants. Here's an example of attracting good bugs. The, uh, the blue-winged um, predatory wasps are all over this plant. This is called mountain mint. The mountain mint is a great insect attractor. Uh, it is also a great uh, plant for your honeybees because it helps them um, not only collect nectar but also the oil on the leaves of this plant uh, knocks off the um, varroa mites which are basically little blood sucking mites that suck the blood out of your honeybees. So uh, this helps uh, your honey pr production, your honeybees, and your pollination, as well as protecting your uh, other plants from many of the bad bugs that you don't want to have on your fruit and berries. <clears throat> in this system, you grow in concentric circles, uh, not in rows. So you will start with a central tree, which will be a fruit or nut tree. Um, you will have a vine layer because vines grow up trees. And around that, you will plant a uh, shrub layer, which will be like blueberries and blackberries. Around that layer, you plant your herb layer, which are your medicinal herbs and your cooking herbs. And then around that layer, you plant your ground covers, which can be anything from clover to buckwheat to um, strawberries, an edible ground cover. What it is? Well, you're actually planting in three dimensions so you can grow five times more food in the same space. Here's an example of when we first uh, set up our garden 
and uh, in the middle there you can see a tall tree that's a peach tree and in front of that you can see our herbs uh, like oregano, um, catnip, uh, parsley, and uh, we've got rosemary thyme and uh, really all of the cooking herbs right there. And then behind that to the side we've got our blueberries and blackberries. And here's an example of those blueberries and blackberries when we first planted them. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned before, vines grow on trees. In nature there are no trellises, so uh, vines grow on trees and grapes being uh, a vine, grapes actually do better on trees than they do on trellises. Here's an example of a two-year-old grape, muscadine grape, that we planted on a trellis. This is a two-year-old grape that we planted on an apple tree. There's a huge difference. And in fact, uh, the grapes on the apple trees produce seven times more fruit than the grapes on the trellises. Here's an example of the symbiotic relationship where the grapes are growing with the apples. You can see the grapes, uh, they're green still, and the apples are just getting started, but they're both growing together and both, both growing better together than they would by themselves. Because you don't use row planting, it looks wild and overgrown. It's kind of like the art of camouflage. It all blends in. There are no definable shapes. Here's an example where you can see various plants all kind of growing together. Um, here we've got mountain mint. Here we've got comfrey, which is a great uh, plant for uh, injuries, sprains, and uh, for um, it's a great compress if you're bleeding. And it also has a 30-foot taproot, which can bring nutrients to the soil for the other plants around it that they couldn't normally reach. We've got um, uh, mint over here, and as you can see, there's a tree right here, and it's actually a pear tree. Now, I'm going to challenge you. Can you see the watermelon in this picture? It's right there. Here's the watermelon. As you can see, um, it's extremely camouflaged. This is an example of a two foot by two foot square space in the garden. Now, we've got beans growing here. This is comfrey. This is mountain mint. And over here, we've got mint. We've also got cucumbers growing here. Um, this is passion fruit growing here. We've got clover. Um, these are peanuts. And um, we've got oats growing in here as well um, for our livestock. And this is all in a two foot by two foot square area. Um, and these plants all do better together than they do by themselves. What it's not, it's not work because all you do is harvest once you set up the garden. Uh, it's not weeding. Um, weeds, as I like to say, are misunderstood plants. Weeds are actually pioneer plants. Uh, they go in and they will grow and they will help uh, break up the ground, allow it to um, allow water and air to penetrate, uh, allow the microorganisms to thrive, and eventually in the natural succession of things they will eventually die back and other plants will take their place and they become uh, compost and nutrients for other plants. But they will grow where no other plant will grow. Uh, they're also great um, because uh, flowers um, will be on those plants, those weeds, uh, late in the season when there is nothing else growing. So they're a great plant for your bees. Uh, weeds to you might be feed to me. Uh, here's an example of a uh, spiny lettuce on the left hand side and here we've got uh, our goats eating that stuff. So I just go through the garden and I don't pull the weeds out by the roots. I will just chop them off and I will throw them to the animals if we want them to, to use those uh, for food. What it's not, it's not using pesticide. 90% of the bugs in a garden are actually good bugs. Um, and uh, unfortunately pesticide kills those good bugs too and usually first. So we want to avoid that uh, wherever we can and because this garden is set up in such a way that you know there are so many symbiotic relationships you don't need pesticide. Uh, you also don't need fertilizer because many of the plants that we have growing in the garden are nitrogen fixers. They actually take nitrogen from the air and they put it back into the soil and make it available for the other plants to use. There's no need for watering. The best place to store water is actually in the ground. So we use berms and terraces to store our water. 
as you can see, you know, water runs downhill, comes down to this little terrace area, and then you've got this little berm right here, and that berm stops the water from continuing to run downhill. So the water puddles in this area here, and eventually seeps into the ground, and what happens is you end up having a lens-shaped pool of water under the berm uh, that your plants that are planted here can tap into and uh, continue to get water even if you've had a drought for weeks at a time. Here's an example of our terraces when we first uh, set them up. You've got land running downhill here, you've got a flat spot here, and you've got a berm right here. Um, we used a lot of mulch uh, in our planting and good decomposed mulch is, a, is really a, a must uh, to be able to hold the soil in place, um, to keep the uh, soil from drying out too much. It helps the microorganisms and all the other, other good uh, bugs uh, find a place to be um, in the garden and ultimately keeps moisture in and uh, too much heat out. Benefits, it provides all the fruits, veggies, nuts, and berries that you and your family can consume. We've got uh, blackberries here, these are figs, peanuts, Asian pears, uh, strawberries, and then uh, because we also have bees, uh, we produce a tremendous amount of honey from our small little area of half an acre uh, with our food forest. In fact, uh, we've got seven hives here, and I have produced 60 pounds 60 pounds of honey per hive per year. We also have uh, you know your regular garden variety vegetables interplanted with our perennials and here's an example of strawberries and blueberries and watermelon that we've taken from the garden. Here's how it looks today. Uh, these are all blackberries here. All of these little white flowers are going to end up being blackberries here we've got some really magnificent looking blueberries um, in this little caged in area. And I use cages um, on some of my fruit to protect it. Um, and particularly blueberries, um, I use this with some deer fence netting on top of it. Uh, the bees can get in and pollinate, but um, the birds can't get in and take it before I can get to it. This is an example of an elderberry. Um, these are just flowering right now, and elderberry is one of the, uh, the best plants to have in a uh, survival situation because the elderberry itself um, is an antiviral, so it will uh, kill a cold if you start to have a cold or any of the other viruses out there. In fact, there's a product out there in the market called Sambucol, which is uh, about $14 for four ounces. You can get that at your local uh, drug stores. Um, but uh, you can grow your own and make your own um, tinctures from, from And here's an example of the uh, very dark purple berries that make up the elderberry once that fruit has set. This is an example of a carrot. This is actually five feet tall, and this is starting to flower now and make seeds. So you can see there's a, there's a pretty big carrot underneath there. And again, this is all done without fertilizer and without pesticides. So here's a picture when we first planted. Um, this is kind of before, and this is that same spot afterwards. This is our, our peach tree. Here's our herbs growing. We've got our berry bushes out behind here, um, and you can see that this thing is, uh, is really grown, and this is in a matter of two years. This is that same peach tree again from the back side, and this is a close-up. You can see we've got all of these beautiful peaches here without any bugs, worms, scabs, etc all without fertilizer and all without pesticide. Here's an example looking back down the hill, back down at the berms. All of these are blackberries, these flowering things right here. And as you can see, uh, it really doesn't look like there's food growing there. It just looks like it's overgrown underbrush. In two years, we went from this apple tree and this little grape to this grape around this apple tree. That's in two years growth. Uh, we went from this barren red clay to this lush food forest in two years. And that's just kind of looking back in the other direction. In two years, we went from red clay hole in the ground to a duck and koi pond uh, that is very nitrogen-rich water, which we can also use to water our 
plants and garden if we need to. And in two years, this is looking from the top of the berm, looking out at the same space. You can see this little house right here is the same one right there. So we went from this barren red clay to this lush food forest here. And that's really the end of the presentation. If you'd enjoyed it, um, if you are interested in learning more about The Secret Garden of Survival or you want to buy The uh, Secret Garden of Survival, the book, How to Grow a Camouflage Food Forest, you can get it in hard copy at Amazon.com. You can get it uh, at Kindle um, at Amazon, and you can also get it in the Nook format at, uh, at Barnes & Noble. Um, it's very detailed. It's step-by-step. -step, it's full of color pictures. And you can also buy it through my website at secretgardenofsurvival.com. If you go to secretgardenofsurvival.com, you can sign up for our Secret Garden News. You can also join our social media. You can see us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and uh, you be, can be looking for a Secret Greenhouse of Survival, uh, which is a, the ultimate prepper greenhouse, which we will be um, in print very soon. And uh, you can also listen to me and uh, many guests on the Secrets of a Survivalist radio show uh, that's on the Preparedness Radio Network. And you can find the link to that as well as the different shows at secretgardenersurvival.com.